Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, some of you may recall I, I was asked to do this talk last October and uh, I got there late, so I uh, missed uh, part of the, didn't get to give the entire presentation. So I'm trying to make up for it here. Uh, this is an area that uh, not, not a lot of people know about, Jews in the Civil War, but I hope that by the end of the talk, uh, you will be much more enlightened. Uh-oh, I want to make the slidings advance and hitting the space bar doesn't do it. Um, do we know that, what is the procedure? You may, have to, you may have to switch over to your PowerPoint window instead of your Zoom window, but we'll still be able to see it hopefully. Okay, let me try this first. S switch over to- Oh no. No, 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 no. Uh, oh. oh, if you click on the PowerPoint, you might be able, just it's anywhere in the window, you might be able to control it with your keyboard. Okay. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Good. Okay, so um, the Jewish population in 1861 was 150,000. Uh, we had uh, about 10,000 uh, Jews served in the Union Army and about 7,000 uh, served in the Confederate Army. Uh, we don't have the, the figures that we have actually are, are, are not as good for the Confederates because they had major fire in Richmond in April of 1865, which destroyed a lot of the records. Uh, when we talk about the Confederate flag, by the way, you'll notice that is indeed what, there were three Confederate national flags. That was the one that was used the most. So the flag that you think about or that has been co-opted by white supremacists is not really the Confederate flag, it's a battle flag. That indeed, what you see there is the Confederate uh, national flag. Uh, Jewish officers, uh, we had 21 colonels and nine generals who served in, in, in uh, the Union Army, this is. Well, actually it's both, I'm sorry, because I'm showing, I'm showing combined figures there, sorry. Uh, the first official Jewish chaplain was Jacob Frankel. Uh, he was commissioned in September 18, 1862 from Congregation Radov Shalom in Philadelphia. So what happened was that we had, we had Christian chaplains in, in the Union Army and the Confederate Army. And um, there, you can see there are considerable uh, Jews, especially in the Union Army. And so ultimately, uh, Chaplains went to, uh, rabbis went to President Lincoln actually, and said, how come if you're, you're, you're com when they pass the law for chaplains, you don't include Jews or rabbis? And Abraham Lincoln said, yeah, we should, and he did. Uh, the Confederate Army did not have, they had, of course, Christian chaplains, but did not have formal Jewish chaplains. They had reverend or, or rabbis who would volunteer and, and you know, some of their local people, because all the Civil War regiments were locally uh, organized. So sometimes rabbis from localities would administer to the men, the Jewish men, but it was not a formal position as it was in the Union Army. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the generals, the, uh, the uh, Union generals. Uh, this was Brigadier General Frederick Solom Solom Solomon, with an A. Uh, he immigrated from Prussia to Wisconsin in 1848. Lots of people came from Germany, of course, to Wisconsin. Uh, he was appointed Brigadier General in 1862, commanded a division at, in Arkansas. He was appointed a Brevet Major. That's an honorary, well, it's not really honorary, but it's, it, it's a field rank, appointed on the field and can be taken away when the war is over. Uh, to, so he became a Major General and he was the brother of Edward Solomon, who was the Civil War era governor of Wisconsin, and Charles Solomon, a Civil War, another Civil War Brigadier General. Uh, this is another Solomon. That's his brother, same guy who we just talked about. This is his brother. Uh, General Leopold Blueberg, he immigrated to Baltimore. A lot of these guys did indeed come from Prussia. Uh, at the onset of the war, he was organized in the 5th Maryland. He was severely wounded at the Battle of Antietam. Uh, he was later appointed the Provost Marshal, which is a guy who's sort of the military police, uh, the Third Maryland uh, by President Lincoln. 
He was a member of Har Sinai Congregation, the oldest continuously reformed congregation in the United States. Uh, he was elected uh, to Congress in 1876. He served eight years as head of the Indianapolis Pension Office. And when this is, General Carl Schurz was a very sort of a, in Civil War circles, was a famous uh, German general. He was with the 11th Corps in the Army of the Potomac. The 11th Corps was predominantly a German uh, Corps. Uh, and so Car this is what Carl Schurz, who was the Corps commander, had to say about this guy. This is at Gettysburg. He was the only soldier who did not dodge Lee's guns thundering as Lee's guns, when Lee's guns thundered. He stood up, smoked his cigar, faced the cannon, cannonballs with the a, with a Sajan Freud of solid. So he was highly praised by his country. This is Bri Bri Brigadier General Frederick Neffler. He immigrated from Hungary in 1849 and he was one of the founders of the Indianapolis Hebrew Congregation. He was originally a captain in the 11th Indiana, and he subsequently became the assistant adjutant general to General Lew Wallace. And of course, Lew Wallace, who was indeed from Indiana, is the author of Ben-Hur. That's what he's the best known for. Uh, but he was a general in the Union Army from Indiana in the American Civil War, I guess. Later served as the territorial governor of New Mexico after the war. Uh, this guy was appointed a colonel of the 79th uh, Indiana Regiment in August of 1862. And he was in the Atlanta campaign and the battles of Franklin and Nashville. That's in Tennessee. Uh, he was appointed a brevet uh, brigadier general in March of 1866. And he was elected. A lot of these guys were elected to Congress too. He was elected to Congress in 1876. And of course, the most one of the most famous Jews associated with the Civil War is Judah Benjamin. Now, Judah Benjamin was a non-observant Jew, actually. He was a Secretary of State. He was also the acting Secretary of War. And he advocated, advocated a plan to allow slaves to bear arms for the Confederacy in exchange for emancipation. He was known as the brains of the Confederacy. Now, indeed, he was a slaveholder. He had a large sugar plantation in Louisiana. I've actually been there. Uh, uh, and uh, so he is a, he's a controversial figure. Uh, he was a lawyer, of course. Uh, after the war, he skipped the country, went to England, where he spent the rest of his life practicing law in England, and he died there. Uh, David Camden de Leon, this is uh, in my area of interest, he was the first Confederate Surgeon General. This guy was from Camden, South Carolina. We're going to talk about another Confederate uh, Surgeon from Camden. He was known as the Fighting General of the Confederacy because he basically uh, was, sur was, was appointed Surgeon General uh, in 1861, but he only served uh, two, three months, and he was replaced by Samuel Preston Moore. Now, Moore ended up serving as a very fine Surgeon General, actually, for the Confederacy, but he, till the end of the war. So this guy, De Leon, was actually the, the first guy, but he ended up not really doing much as Surgeon General. Uh, after the war, he went to Mexico uh, and eventually returned and lived and practiced in New, in, in New Mexico. Now, this is a man who I actually have a whole lecture on. Uh, this is Dr. Simon Baruch. He was a surgeon from the, the he was from, also from Camden. De Leon was from Camden and, and Baruch was from Camden. He was a surgeon in the 3rd South Carolina Battalion, it's called. He is the father indeed of Bernard Baruch. I believe most of you probably have heard of Bernard Baruch. He is considered the father of the appendectomy. After the war, he was practicing in New York. He had a family visiting him from Camden. They had a 12 year old uh, son came down with appendicitis. Previously, the treatment of appendicitis was non-operative. You either died from it or in some cases you could survive. Baruch decided that he had been studying under various uh, physicians in New York at the time. One was a very prominent surgeon and he, he called uh, this guy who recommended one of his, his under his, his uh, uh, persons who he had trained actually, 
who came, did the appendectomy successfully, he caught on. Uh, this was when the telephones had first come in and Baruch's telephone was jammed because what he was, what he would do is not do the surgery. He would be the, he would get the surgeon to do the surgery. So a doctor would call Dr. Baruch. He would then recommend a surgeon to do the surgery. He was also a pioneer in hydrotherapy and public baths. Uh, he, was, he wrote several books on this. He had what was called the water cure for pneumonia. And during the, very relevant to the day, uh, during the 1918 flu epidemic, he was brought into Walter Reed by the military to, show, to assist in treating pneumonia patients with his, his, his water cure. Whether it worked or not, I don't know. He was, he was also the father of the public baths for the pool uh, in New York City. Uh, Baruch was actually captured twice during the war. Uh, he uh, was left behind in the Battle of Antietam and the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, he uh, became a very prominent, as I said, prominent uh, 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 surgeon in, or physician, I should say, in, the, in New York after, after the war. Can't, South, he, he started in South Carolina, but it really, it, I, he outgrew South Carolina. He was a very prominent promoter, by the way. Um, another thing that's re relevant till to, to today of vaccination. He, he really was, and we're talking mostly in, that, in those days about smallpox vaccination. Uh, Baruch was a big promoter of vaccination, both when he was in South, especially when he was in South Carolina, and then when he uh, moved north to New York. He always was very generous with working with the poor. Uh, he did, in, he is a controversial figure in some ways. He treated black patients. He was one of the first doctors in South Carolina to do that. Uh, some say he was in the Klan, however. Uh, he, in Bernard Baruch's autobiography, his memoir, he talks about buying a Klan robe that his father had. Um, I try to do some research on this, and what I could find is not that he definitely was a Klan member, but he did belong to what was called Hampton's Red Shirts. Now, Wade Hampton was the governor of South Carolina. He also was a, a very prominent general in the Confederate Army from South Carolina. During the in 1876 uh, uh, gubernatorial campaign, he had this group called the Hampton's Red Shirts, uh, which were sort of young guys who uh, rode around in red shirts and they did some intimidation. Uh, they were not uh, liberals, let's put it that way. Uh, Baruch apparently had some affiliation with them. He, he indeed was a man of his time. He, uh, even though he was a Jew, uh, he had some racist uh, tendencies perhaps. Uh, we, don't, we don't know positively, uh, but uh, and, and he, he was a very interesting figure when he got older. Uh, he would go to the opera in New York or he'd go to the theater. If he ever heard a, bla a band play Dixie, he would get up and give the rebel yell in his 80s. Uh, he, when Bernard Baruch was a teenager, actually, he took him to visit Gettysburg. Baruch was at Gettysburg. He was a surgeon at Gettysburg. He was left behind there and captured by the Union Army. Uh, however, his recollection by that time had been a little fuzzy. He was trying, there's a very famous charge in the Battle of Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge. And he was told Bernie that, uh, yeah, boy, our third South Carolina, we're in Pickett's Charge. They were not in Pickett's Charge. They were in some very bloody battles at Gettysburg with that particular one they were not in. Now these are the, there were there were 1,522 medals of honor awarded during the war, and these are the seven Jews who who won medals of honor. Uh, I did. We'll read you one of the citations, which is for um, this would be Benjamin Levy, because I thought his citation was most of them just said for gallantry for this and that. Uh, this guy's citation read. The soldier, a drummer boy, took the gun of a sick comrade, went into the fight, and when the color bears were shot down, carried the colors and saved them from capture. That's this guy right here, Benjamin Levy. He was a, he was a kid. He was a drummer boy. Drummer boys were like 10, 12 years old. All right. One of the more famous incidents concerning the Jews in the Civil War is General Grant's ish order number 11, 
was is issued December 17th of 1862. Uh, it required Jews to leave the Department of the Tennessee, which include the states of Tennessee, Kentucky, and Mississippi. That was under Grant's command at the time. Uh, designated to cut off the illegal trade in black market cotton, which was largely blamed on the Jews. A group of Jewish leaders met with President Lincoln, who rescinded the order January 3rd, 1863. This was not one of Grant's finest hours. In fact, he wrote in his memoirs, this is one of the major things he regretted doing. Uh, so uh, it was not something that stuck. Lincoln, Lincoln would have none of it. Uh, he, he for sure shouldn't have done it. One of the problems was that his father, who was involved in the cotton trade, got involved with two, a couple of Jewish guys called the Mason Brothers in Cincinnati, and they were involved in the cotton trade. They came into Grant's camp in Tennessee and tried to get Grant to go along with their scheming, and he kicked them out. And some people think that because he didn't have the best relationship anyhow with his father. We don't have time to discuss Grant and his father. But indeed, Grant uh, had that problem. And uh, some people think that's the motivation. Now, Grant, as I say in his memoirs, said he totally regretted that. And one of the things when he was president, he tried to do to uh, sort of make amends. Because we know that we, 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 we know the, uh, 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 the synagogue that uh, it, it was started in 1876. Uh, Addis Israel. I go to services there. So Addis uh, started there in 1876, and when they had their dedication service, Grant came. He was president, and the service lasted three hours. It was all in Hebrew, and of course they told him, "Mr. President, you don't have to stay." He'd stayed for the entire three hours. He then wrote him a ten-dollar check, and. Uh, the congregation still had, they, of course, they didn't cash it, so the congregation still has the check that President Grant wrote. So he, he did try to make amends for what he did. Uh, and here was the President's response, by the way, to this Special Order 11. To condemn a class is to say that the least, to wrong the good with the bad. I do not like to hear a class or national, nationality condemned on account of a few sinners. Uh, this was a Jewish murder. Caesar Costco was a Jewish merchant in Paducah who was kicked out of his home. And he personally met with President Lincoln on January 30, 1863, as did Isaac Merwise, a very famous rabbi. He met with the president July, January 6 to thank him for uh, rescinding the order. Uh, now, this is uh, President Lincoln's chiropodist or his foot doctor, Dr. Uh, Ishigur Zachariah. Uh, he treated President Lincoln in his cabinet and became close friends with the president. He was sent to New Orleans in 1862 to size up the community's attitude toward the government. He was sent to Richmond to meet with Confederate leaders, including Judah Benjamin and other cabinet members. And he supposedly hammered out an agreement to depose Emperor Maximilian and set up a new Southern government in its place, which was vetoed by Washington decision makers. Uh, Dr. Zacharias, here's what Lincoln said about Dr. Zacharias. Uh, uh, Dr. Zachary has operated on my feet with great success and considerable addition to my comfort. Now we've heard of the Lehman Brothers with the 2008 financial crisis. And they went bankrupt, Lehman Brothers, but they started out as cotton brokers in, uh, in Alabama. There's Henry, Emanuel, and Meyer. Uh, they raised money for Alabama POWs. Uh, Henry was appointed a commissioner to visit Confederate POWs. He sold Alabama bonds and services, serviced the state's debt. They moved to New York uh, post the war and formed the Lehman and Brett investment firm. And the picture in the bottom is from a recent movie and play called the Lehman Trilogy, which gives the entire story of the Lehman brothers. Uh, I think they were in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, so, but they did start out as cotton brokers, but they realized there was more money to be made in uh, investments. Did Lincoln support a Jewish homeland? Here's a quote, supposedly. I myself have regard for the Jews. My chiropodist is a Jew. And he has put, has at many times 
put me on my feet, that I would have no objection to giving his countrymen a leg up. Uh, now there's the dark side of the Jews too. Uh, this guy, sorry, Rabbi, Rabbi Jacob Levin was a Columbia, South Carolina uh, slave trader. There were also a large uh, slave trading firm owned by Jews in Richmond. Apparently when there's money to be made, we'll, we will be there. Uh, this is an ad for Negroes in auction uh, to be sold by Le Rabbi Levin uh, uh, on January the 3rd. I'm not sure what year that is, but that's a typical ad that they would put in a newspaper when they're about to sell slaves. This, this I don't think is true, but a rabbi in his eulogy to the president said, the minute Abraham Lincoln believed himself to be bone and flesh from our flesh. He is supposed himself a descendant of Hebrew parentage. He said so in my presence. Well, I don't know that is true. Uh, there's no evidence if you look at Lincoln's ancestry from England that he did have Jewish ancestry, but uh, you can take that one as you will. Okay, so that's that's it. And we'll, people have questions. I sent you a chat question. Yeah, me too. About a guy named Charles Moyes. I understand that he had some um, input in the, the Confederate battle flag, which we're all familiar with, that the original design was going to be a cross. Uh, as opposed to the X with the stars, yeah, in. I, some input on changing that. Do you know? What yeah, I, mean? I don't know much about about that. I, I I have heard that story, and it, it may well be true. The the Confederates went through three, as I said earlier, three different battle flags, um, and they ran into trouble with their with one of their battle flags, and they had a uh, Canton, but the rest of the flag was white, and so therefore when they flew it, it looked sometimes like a flag of surrender. So they had to add a red bar at the end, right at the end of the war in order to disabuse people of that. They were actually trying to surrender with the flag. But I, I think that may be, may be right, but I, I don't have a lot more information than, than you do. Thank you. Uh, sure. I'd like to ask you about Baruch, Bernard Farouk. You mentioned like he was Affiliated with the Klan, which was unbelievable what I heard. Yes, not Bernard Baruch, Simon Baruch. Simon, yeah. The father of Bernard. It's unbelievable. This is a story that Bernie himself apparently says in his own uh, autobiography. And, and every time I bring up Simon Baruch to Civil War audiences, this is a question I get about Baruch and his affiliation with the Klan. And like I said, I couldn't de definitely pin it down. Others believe it. I said that I, I did find he did have some, some, in, some uh, affiliation with the Hamptons Red Shirts, which was not quite as bad as the Klan, but it was one of these kind of groups too, supporting. I weight. still can't believe it. <laughs> History is tricky. <laughs> Um, I have a comment and a question. I sent you the question in chat, but I don't, I don't know if it went through. Uh, the comment first is that in terms of Lincoln's potential Jewish roots, um, what I have read is that he came, his, his ancestry was from Lincolnshire, which is how he got his name. And in, in that area, was the area around York, which is where and most Jews. of the Jews most of the Jews lived prior to the expulsion of the Jews from England. So he probably believed that, uh, you know, genetically there was some, uh, you know, some reason for that. Well, as you see from the quote, if you believe that quote, he did believe that. So. Yeah, <laughs> and my. My question uh, that I wrote to you is that I had also read that compared to the number of Jews in the country at the time, the Jewish enrollment in the armed services, you know, on both sides, 
if you compared it to the how few the Jews were in the country, uh, that they were like the highest um, serving ethnic group in both wars, in yeah. both sides. Well, if, if you do the math, I guess so, because um, there were about 22 million people in the country at, in the North at, at that time. And like I said, about 12,000 Jews served in the Union Army. Uh, of course, about 2 million people served in the Union Army. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very, very small percentage of the total Union Army. Mm -hmm. It's over 2 million served. So, but it, you're, to your point, that's probably right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Will and I have a question if yes. I may. It's sort of like the one we just spoke about with the KKK, but not exactly. It's it's about Jewish attitudes about being Southerners. I've always tried to imagine what it must have been like to sit at a Seder table and be reading the Haggadah about being freed from slavery while the, the staff are in the kitchen preparing the meal to come out and hear the Jews at the table talk about being freed from slavery and they are slaves. To you, your discussion is more about the Civil War, not life in the South, but did anything that you've encountered shed some light on this? To me, it's a serious paradox. Uh, that's true, uh, but even in the South, the majority of Jews were not slaveholders. They were merchants, as Jews tend to be, you know, uh, and or business owners, because uh, that's what was open to them. Uh, but the, like, there were exceptions, I, and Benjamin being one of the biggest. And then it, the thing that really blew, how would you like to have a Seder if you're the rabbi who's a slave trader? <laughs> That, that one, I, I really was, that's why I wanted to include that to, when I found out there actually was a rabbi who was a slave trader. But I added, did, was there any difficulty in the minds of congregations among the membership, among Jews who did or did not believe in slavery but lived in the South? Was, was this a social issue among Jews in the South at the time that you've encountered? Not that I could run into, I think Jew, Jews were pretty proud to be living where they lived, you know, the New Orleans and was a big center and, and um, there's a, a synagogue in, in Charleston even. I've been to the synagogue in, Char in Charleston that was there during the war and Richmond, of course, and you know, my wife's family is from Richmond and they, they belong to a synagogue which, you know, was there during the war. <laughs> Yeah, I As a matter of fact, my my uh, my father-in-law worked for. If you know Richmond, there's a, was a department store chain there at one time called Tallheimer's, and uh, there was a Lieutenant William Tallheimer in the Confederate Army. So, so uh, they they were all in for the cause. Some of them. <laughs> you got a question? Yes. Uh, were there any Jews in, in Lincoln's cabinet? Uh, Jews in Lincoln's cabinet, I do not think so. I can think of no Jews. I guess the closest confidant to Lincoln who was Jewish was his uh, podiatrist. Well, and that note, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Willen, for a fascinating education uh, uh, discussion. Hope you uh, you'd uh, come back and give us more of the the discussions on the about Jews in the Civil oh, War era. Looking thank you very much. And yeah. um, we invite you to